Hi, this is Rich Harrington, and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast. We're going to be joining Kevin Kubota here in just a moment, but Skip Cohen, how are you doing? Hey, Rich. Um, I'm glad we're all set up for everybody that that needs or wonders why we're running a couple minutes late. It is not Rich's fault. It is the hotel's (laughs) fault. Wherever on planet Earth he is right now, so... Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in New Jersey, and things are definitely lagging a little bit. I don't have the fastest bandwidth here, so I may drop to audio only here, folks, because I'm sure my lips and my mouth are not in sync. But we'll go from there. That's but kind of fun, though. Of... It looks like a bad uh, foreign film. Yes, yes. Okay. You killed right. my father. I wasn't actually talking there. I was just moving the mouth. So (laughs) let's get started. We've got a great guest. Skip, why don't you introduce our guest? You know him best. Tell him a little bit about who we have today, and then we'll let Kevin say hello to folks as well. We have Kevin Kubota with us, of which depending on where you came or when you came into photography, there are a lot of people that think Kevin is just a genius on the software development side. There are a number of people that go back farther that know he's, that know and understand he's one of the finest photographers in our industry. But he's also a writer, a teacher, he's an outstanding speaker, he's responsible for Photographers Ignite each year at uh, WPPI. And I think one of the neatest things of all is that he is a tremendous um, philanthropist and supporter in terms of just giving his time back to the industry and charities that he believes in and I'm really excited that we got Kevin with us tonight and you could get him to stand still for mind your own business so uh, Kevin how's that? good to see you that was Hello. Great. Wow. that was awesome thank you very much <laughs> thanks guys an honor to be on your uh, on your program and hear good things about it so it's cool to actually be here myself yeah, I would like to point out that all of those stunning images behind Kevin, I took I took all of those. Those are that's my work. He likes to have it on display. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I collect I collect uh, work from from other photographers and keep them in my studio. It helps me look better. Uh, <laughs> jo- joking aside, there are a few photographers who've gotten in trouble for taking other photographers' work and trying to put it as Ooh. their own. But Kevin, I know you're just yeah. being modest. Those are your great photos, so nobody thinks otherwise. And uh, it's good that you have such good work. Yes, we well, are joking. We need a joke meter, uh, a little sign that flickers <laughs> in the scene, sign when we're joking, right? I kid, I kid. So, <laughs> Skip, where do you want to? Where do you want let's, to start? Thinking? Let's start. I mean, one of the very cool things that Kevin has been involved in, um, far more than digital workflow, is business workflow. And I know Kevin's also got some some new material out there that's available. And let's just start right in with that because one of the biggest challenges that I hear from new photographers, established photographers, longtime seasoned veterans, is that they're trying to figure out their their business workflow. It's not just the digital workflow anymore. It's the entire workflow of the business. It ties back to um, everything from customer service and working with your clients to social media to every component of your business now. Kevin, I'm going right. to lead with that and let you jump in wherever you want to go on that one. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's certainly a huge topic. Um, business workflow um, involves so many different aspects and I you know when I, I've been used to teaching workflow as it relates to Lightroom or image management and that sort of thing but workflow actually has to do with um, everything from just organizing your files and managing your contacts and the people that you uh, market to as a photographer so having a system for everything has been important for me and I'm you know you've been in this couple years longer than me anyway so you You're you have quiet. a you have a same the sense of being in the business takes much more than just one aspect being perfect. You have to kind of uh, do a l- pretty well in a lot of aspects of your business, which adds up to your whole business doing well. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people kind of miss is they focus on just one thing to do fantastic, and that's great. You can be a fantastic photographer, but if you really are not very good at your business or your workflow or customer service. Um, you really can't succeed, and it's. I think it's doing pretty well in a lot of areas adds up to success rather than being really good in one area or not very good in any area, of course. Well, well let's. I think. Go ahead, Rich. Let me. 
Yeah, well, two things. I just wanted to say, uh, for folks that are watching, and thank you for joining us, this isn't our regular time, but I had a crazy schedule this week. Uh, this is great. Remember, folks, you can actually submit questions. There's the Q&A pod, so you can click the Q&A button on the overlay player and submit your questions in if you'd like, or you can put them in the comments, and we'll try to get to those, so that's great. Ask questions. It improves your chance to win. We actually are going to be giving away, at the end of tonight's broadcast, a full conference pass to Photoshop World. Now, this is one of those things, Kevin, that's actually where I first met you, is at a Photoshop World. And so as Skip mentioned, you know, you are well known for working in some of the software side of things, but you've also been well involved in the industry. One of the challenges that I've faced as I've tried to refine my career is that self-doubt that comes with, am I trying to do too many things? What should I outsource? What should I be doing? What should I be pushing right. myself to grow on? What's important that I do? You know, for example, for years I avoided doing sales. I hated sales. I didn't like it. And then I realized that, well, you know, my name is the name on the company. And these are people that are contacting me. And I've got 14 people working for me. And I need to be the one that at least people feel confident that they can reach out to. How do you balance all these different needs of growing yourself, growing your business, knowing where to raise your hand and know where to step back? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because it does um, beg the question of uh, do you want to train yourself to be a better salesman if you really just don't like sales? And uh, one of the things that I've discovered over the years is that uh, I tried to do everything myself designed my own logos, my own graphics many years ago. I you know, managed everything, did my own taxes, which was completely insane for <laughs> any business owner yeah, to try I, to do I learned that taxes. lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I was one of those control freaks that I had to do everything myself, and I truly believe now that whatever you can get other people who are better than you at something to help with, uh, the better off you're going to be. And uh, that's one of the reasons my wife is such an uh, integral part of our business is she's great at the customer relations. She loves just chitting, chatting with people. She's great at the sales. Um, things that I'm maybe not as good at, she's really good at. So we complement each other and I've, I've found that letting go of a lot of uh, the things that I'm not the best at and, or bringing someone in to do that if you can't do it uh, is really important and, and it pays off. You know, same with uh, outsourcing your graphic design if you're not a great designer. I see so many photographers that try to wing it and design their own logos and their own business materials and it looks homemade and it just reflects on your business poorly so it, it pays to get help when you need professional help. <laughs> Skip, what do you think? Where do you want to take this? Well, what happens when photographers decide to take it on all themselves? The only person that can really market your business is you. This is a word of mouth business. We are a service related business and as a professional photographer, your time talking to potential clients, being involved in your community, being involved in other photo groups in the community, I mean, you represent your company, and there's nobody that can do that as good as you can. So when you start talking about how much time somebody is spending, you know, not farming things out or not delegating and not looking for some other resources, what's really happening is that by doing it all yourself, you're sitting there using up the most valuable time you've got, which is marketing time. And that's what's so important. And that's why all of this, when, when you start talking about your workflow, um, it's a combination of things that you should be doing and can be doing, and then everything you possibly can delegate um, or outsource or right source, as Jeff Yoakum used to say. Um, is what you want to get out of the out of the pipeline, so that you're really free to market yourself. And Kevin's right. I mean, I I've spent a lot of time hanging out with Kevin and Claire over the years, and they do complement each other. And a lot of cases where there's a spouse or a sibling um, or another member of the family involved, that can work fine. But when you don't have somebody like that, that that is really part of your family, that doesn't mean you need to just give up hope. You need to find somebody who can start to learn aspects of your business. Um, I keep thinking about my my battle with the uh, the gallbladder from hell about five years ago, and fortunately for me, Scott Bourne stepped in and helped with a couple of posts and things. But I had no backup. 
had never thought about it, never planned on being in the hospital with a gallbladder problem. And it's so important for you to have the depth because that gives your workflow uh, more integrity and more credibility. And I guess, Kevin, can you do you mind talking like a minute or two? I know you've got you've got some new software out that relates to workflow, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, let's sit on that, uh, and then maybe Rich and I can take that in some other directions too. Sure. Yeah, one of the the new things we have out is called Kumu, and it's a studio management software for photographers. And it really came about because I would teach my classes. You know, we do workshops, full day workshops on um, boot camp, workflow, photography, etc. So nuts to bolts. And one of the things that we always do is we start at the very beginning, get organized, plan your marketing strategy, get your contacts, your jobs in order, figure out where everything is so you don't waste time looking for a job or trying to figure out how to process a job when it has to be done to make yourself more efficient. You just you know where to go. So one of the things that I developed for my own studio was a, was a business management software. And I would uh, share it with the people in my workshops and the more I shared it, the more people said, we, I need something like that. I, I need something that's simple. I need something that's affordable. Uh, I don't want to pay monthly fees. I don't need these super powerful programs. I really just need a nice, simple, but also part of a complete system uh, studio management software. So that's kind of what we developed with our Kumu studio management software was something that integrates with my Lightroom workflow system, but it tracks your contacts, your invoices, your jobs. Um, everything about what you do in your photography business and um, puts it all in place, creates reports to show you how you're doing. Uh, but main thing, it just keeps everything in one place so you know where everybody is, what their status of their jobs are, where their jobs are in your computer and all of that. So it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, and, and actually kind of fun to use piece of software that uh, we, we just launched it. So it's just out the door like last week. Very if you cool. had to pick the three to five major categories or, or more than that. How does it how does it break down into what the major topics are? Uh, it's well contact management, uh, job tracking, uh, it, invoicing, creating invoices is very important because uh, one of the things over the years I would uh, fall behind on creating my invoices because they were too tedious to create. So I would just put them off, put them off, and then I forget what to invoice somebody for. So keeping that track of that, but also linking. Uh, it has a cool way of linking every person, every job you shoot to their actual Lightroom catalog and part of my Lightroom workflow system is teaching people how to use one catalog per job and then connect that to the client inside of Kumu. So it's you click a button and pops open their catalog, you've got all their images, uh, everything you need for that one client is one in one place. So it's a, um, it's a, it's a full, it's not just a standalone business management software, it's part of a full system and when you use the whole system it's amazing how, how efficient you can become. Well, let me take this up to a higher level for a second. We had a good question from Adam, forgive me if I mispronounce, I believe Bucci, and he was asking about, you know, besides the post-production workflow, how much time are you spending on each assignment? Well, before we get into the specific time, because obviously every job's different, let's maybe break down some of the core things, you know, you were talking about, uh, you know, since this is a podcast focused on business, I, I want to put aside the shoot and the post-production for a second. We could talk about how business ties into that, but let's focus for a second on the pre-production. We're going to say you've got a live opportunity, not drumming up leads, but somebody says, oh, I want to work with you, or you get a referral and you're ready to start. Kevin, you brought up the contact management. This is something that I think a lot of us are really bad at. And, you know, you get business cards, you go to conferences, you meet a bunch of people, you get a recommendation from folks. I found, for example, that my LinkedIn profile has been extremely useful for opening up additional business contacts. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm keeping these things organized. So for me, I have a couple of things. I've got my LinkedIn database so I could track people as they move around so I don't lose them after they move from one job to another. But at the same time, you need to keep in touch with all of these people. What are some things you've learned the hard way of managing these contacts and why is it so important that when you capture that lead or you capture that client, what sort of information do you need to get? What do you do with it? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's great. It's awesome that you're using LinkedIn and all your resources that way. And I think that um, that is in a, definitely an area where a lot of people drop the ball is we, we hear of a potential contact and instead of immediately entering them in, you know, let's start at the beginning. Um, if I if I meet somebody and I think they're a potential client, we're talking about photography clients here, um, I put them into my phone immediately and I put some notes, uh, keywords and things like portrait, wedding, you know, pregnancy, whatever I think they might be interested in. And if I can collect obviously a contact phone or email, um, great, because they're going to go on to an email list, which uh, as soon as you get back, and one of the things I love to do if you if you have the opportunity to get an address, um, I think a handwritten card is, is something that's kind of a lost art. Uh, send them a card just, hey, it was great to meet you. You know, I get these from people sometimes, and it really kind of blows me away when I get a card just because somebody met me and they were saying it was so nice to meet you, and they took the time to write a card. I put those on my desk, and I save those for a while because it, you know, gives me a happy face when I look at those cards. So. Yeah. I know that that works when I send those to my clients, even when I haven't done anything for them yet. I just want to kind of initiate our relationship. So um, collecting that information right away is so important. And, you know, we have our smartphones. Enter it right in there. And as soon as I get back to my office, I'll put them into my contact management system, um, keywording them, like I said, with what potential jobs they could be interested in. And then start, you know, sending them out. Hey, I've got a special coming up on uh, portrait sessions. We've got, you know, family portraits special next month or whatever. Or just say hi. But you know, that's where you start off is getting them in there and making it. Staying in touch is so important because we, so many times we just let people go, and it's not because we don't care. We just have too many other things to think about. So, get them in there and send off an initial contact. I think is a really important first step. One of the things that I've noticed, and Skip, I'd like you to address this as well, is that I see a lot of photographers become really obsessed with their social media accounts, and they spend way too much time networking with other photographers. And, you know, not that Google Plus communities and other communities aren't awesome. I think it's great to learn from each other. Sometimes this could be a lonely career. It's nice to interact with a peer or have something to bounce off. But if you're spending more time connecting with your peers and your colleagues and you're not spending an equal amount of time at least taking the leads and managing the leads you have, you shouldn't be scratching your head if you're wondering why you don't have enough leads. Oh, man, I couldn't agree more on that one. I mean, this is where, this is where programs like, like Pinterest have, have come in because it is more of a consumer-based. Facebook is more consumer-based. Um, but you do, see, you do see a ton of photographers. Now, for me, social media is all with photographers because trying to keep um, SCU going is, is all about education. And Rich, you know, you do a lot of the same things with Photo Focus. Our target audience is definitely the photographer, but you're 100% right. Um, the meaning of the word networking has gotten so abused at this point. You know, in the old days, everybody collected business cards. And I remember Tony Corbell having them all in alphabetical order in a binder. And he even had different cards for the same person. So somebody that might have been at Polaroid, that went to Fuji, that wound up somewhere else. And he'd have all their business cards and all their titles. And, you know, that was fine, and that was fun to go back and look through and remember people that you might have met at a show that were in that booth last year, and this year they were over in that booth. But the reality is that maintaining a good network, there's a, there's a thing about care and feeding of your network. And, again, if your network has been based on almost exclusively photographers that you've met at the shows and, and the, the people at the vendors um, that you work with, the staff, um, that's fine. That's important to have as part of your network, but really maintaining your contact list about um, potential clients is what it's all about. And I want to hit on something just real quick that Kevin talked about. The issue of a handwritten note card, hey everybody, it's back with a vengeance. We are back to things that worked 30, 40 years ago and your mother probably yelled at you once to write a thank you note to your grandmother for something. We're back to that because nothing gets through the noise better than a handwritten note. It's, it's personal. We, we, do, and it, we do that on every project, Skip. I have the yeah. staff 
pull out the stationery. We have cards for the office, and everybody who touched that project and worked on it writes us, you know, the single thank you note to the client. Everyone who worked on it signs it. It makes a difference when people are choosing who to work with. They remember you. Well, the ultimate on this is a good is a mutual friend of ours, Levi Sim, who after the first Skip Summer School he went to, actually sent a thank you note to my wife Sheila, thanking her for the time that she has to give up when I get involved in all these projects. So it goes a long way. But again, let's go back to your network. Kevin talked about maintaining your contact base. Everybody is constantly looking for databases they can buy and new territory and you tend to forget about your your own home database your past clients maintaining a relationship with them even uh, along with a handwritten note just picking up the phone now and then is going to carry just as much weight the point is you've got to manage those contacts and if Kevin's if if Kumu helps you do that then wow there, there's another level to be able to make sure that you're developing business because you met somebody they were interested in you they already know who you are and it's kind of a slam dunk to at least take it to the next step of approaching them with something that you have that meets their needs so yeah. Kevin you've captured the contact now what say it again sorry Rich you have captured the contact what do you do next oh yeah, I mean, I was just thinking in what Skip said, you know, it's so often when we meet people and everybody's had this experience, you, you, maybe you see an old client on the street and you're like, hey, oh, it's so good to see you. Uh, we should connect. We should have lunch. Or, hey, I've got somebody who might be interested in a, in a wedding. You know, you should call them or whatever. And we say, yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. But then how often do you really follow through and do that? And I think it's really kind of cool when you make a real uh, concerted effort to follow up on every single possible opportunity like that. So whenever somebody says, yeah, I'm interested, call me, let's do lunch, let's get together, uh, let me introduce you to somebody, follow up on that. And, you know, like I said, I just use my smartphone because I can't remember everything. And my wife's not always there to help me remember everything. Mm -hmm. So I put it into my phone, you know, and I put a date and an alarm that says, call this person back on this date about this that we talked about. Even if it's just to say, hey, I'm just calling to touch base. Don't even know what you're going to sell them at that point or anything. You just want to do what you say you're going to do and be one of those people that people remark to other people, wow, it was amazing. He said he's going to contact me, and he did. And I think that's really important. And I'm certainly not perfect at that, but that's one thing that I strive to do. And I found when I do that with clients, it's been really effective to help me stay foremost in their mind. Well, I'll do that exactly. Like, you know, right on my phone, you know, Siri, set a reminder. And I could say, you know, contact so-and-so. And I could create a reminder or an event. Or I can add it to a Google Doc. I use an app called Things that syncs to my computer. And these allow me to create milestones. And then I could see if I've fallen behind on that. It'll keep reminding me until I check it off that it's done. But I've got to tell you, there's been plenty of times I learned a long time ago that a no is not really a no meaning that you don't want to be pushy, but if I ask you, do you have any projects coming up right now, the answer might be no. Not no, I don't want to give them to you, or no, I don't want to work with them. I don't have anything now. So I'll follow up and say, oh, well, when's the next best time I should check in with you? Should I check in with you next month? You know, we need this. You know, you, you've got this t deadline coming up. I know you have this big event. When do you start planning for that? You know, when do you yeah. need on-site crew? And I try to better understand them, and then I check in. And when I do that, we've got some clients that we've done work for, you know, five, six, seven years. They keep hiring us for the same event every year, and each year they reach out a little bit sooner. But by putting it on my calendar and looking back at my calendar from past years, I spot business opportunities. It's so much easier to take an existing customer and make them a repeat customer than it is to get a new customer. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. At, uh, at some of my workshops, I have a saying when we talk about asking for business, which is, uh, what, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, uh, I think, so important that we learn how to ask for business. But one of the things I, I tell people in the workshops is a no answer is not a no answer, meaning that if someone doesn't reply or they don't specifically give you a no, then that doesn't mean no. 
And it's not a no until they specifically say, no, I don't want to work with you, like you said. Yeah. So sometimes and, and it's, we'll, the, you know, we'll we happen with sometimes email we'll a lot. We send out email and, sorry? I was just going to say, sometimes you will get a no, and you have to accept it. But Yeah, you know. right. All right, but wait a minute, you, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I want to I talk about when you do get the no. Um, I have a friend who's a realtor in Las Vegas, and when he doesn't get a listing, he goes back to that potential client in a really, really nice way to just say, look, you know, we're very proud of our business. We do a great business here in Vegas. I'd love to know what you feel that we missed. Mm -hmm. So it, it's true. You have to accept the no. You're not going to be able to browbeat them into turning it into a yes usually. But going back to a potential client who did turn you down, there's some good, there's some good information there, some good intelligence that you can draw just by going back to them and just just being nice about it, not to make them feel uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. hey, we, we take a lot of pride in our service. Can you tell me what, what we were missing that didn't get us the listing? And he's learned a lot of valuable customer service information about things he needed to do or the way he was being interpreted in something that he had pitched. Uh, absolutely. No, that's fantastic advice because you want to learn. I mean, when we do a job, one of the things after we've finished with the clients is I always follow up and I say, I usually wait, you know, well, how did it go over? You know, how did everything work out? You know, if we did a thing and we helped them on their annual report, you know, how was it received? What did your boss think of it? Great. Is there anything that you'd like us to do differently for you next time or anything else that I can do to help you on this project? And by mm -hmm. asking, you know, you're opening it up. A lot of times people need permission to tell you that you weren't perfect. But by getting it off their chest, they almost feel better and they want to work with you more the next time because they're like, oh, they really do want me happy. They don't just want my money. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's also one of the hardest things for sometimes for us sensitive photographers to do is to to ask what we did wrong or find out what we did wrong. I know for me it's hard because I'm, you know, sensitive to criticism sometimes. So if you don't have a wife who can ask it for you, then, then learning to ask it yourself is is really important. And like Skip said, we, we learn from our mistakes, and uh, being able to find out what you can do better next time is not just a, uh, an empty thing we're throwing out there to get them to change their mind. It really is something important for you to learn what you can do better. And that's, but it's hard. I mean, I admit, for me, it's hard to do, and I've had to really work extra hard at overcoming that over the years. We had a question before we move on to um, some of the pre-production. Laureen Liberty asked us a question. We talked about LinkedIn and Pinterest. She said, how do you incorporate other social media sites? Are you doing anything with Facebook pages, Instagram, Twitter? Um, I'm going to throw a handful of things out just to put a button on this. And, and for everybody, it's going to be different. But here's my short version. Um, our mutual friend Scott Bourne taught me that Twitter was a broadcast medium, meaning I could tell people who are interested in what we're working on what we're up to, and I could share good news, and I could talk about what's going on in very short bursts, and it creates passive intimacy, the ability for people to just sort of know what's happening. Facebook, I personally keep my Facebook account incredibly limited. I try to keep it below 600 friends, and people, to some people, like, that's a lot of friends, but I'm a relatively public figure with a lot of clients. I have more than 600 clients through the years. But I keep past clients that I enjoy, people that I might eat a lunch with, that I actually get to know. I know a little bit about them or their kids. They know about me. And I use it like a real person. I talk about the same things we talk about. What have I been up to? Oh, there's his cool thing. And it makes me more of a human, and it allows me, when somebody else has a need or a question or a problem, because I've kept that so small, I can interact. And so people are like, how do you have 17,000 Twitter followers and 600 friends on Facebook? Did you buy your Twitter followers? No, never. Those are just people that are interested in what I'm doing. But my Facebook audience, for me, are people that I actually care about. And it generates tons of opportunities, tons of resources because by keeping it smaller, I actually have a more personal relationship with my best customers. Skip, you use these tools differently. Kevin, anything you want to add? Go yeah, ahead, I Kevin. think. Skip. No, go, ahead. go ahead, Kevin, and then I'll jump in. Uh, 
I was going to add that uh, I think it's, first of all, important to find out where your clients actually like to interact and hang out. I mean, most clients in the portrait wedding kind of category are on Facebook, so that's great if uh, you have a Facebook account and you're active on it, like you said. Um, I have to admit, I was in Facebook a long time ago before I really knew how to use it, and so I was just taking in friends left and right until I hit the limit, and now it's kind of hard because you can't unfriend, so I'm kind of maxed out at, I think it's 5,000 or something on a personal page, and yeah. most of those, of course, I have no idea who they are. <laughs> so I, if I was doing it all over again, I would be more selective, like you said, and and choose people that I, I knew would interact with me and that I could interact with, and uh, I don't know a, a, a process now for kind of regurgitating and starting over again, and maybe somebody else does you know a better way to deal with that, but um, I think Facebook would be a great way to have more personal interactions, but the way it is with mine right now, it's too kind of hard to do that, so I'm, uh, I have to stick with, you know, connections, email connections or um, phone calls or personal connections with clients, but um, with photographers in general, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's just a great way to kind of announce what's going on and share and interact a little bit, but um, I'd probably do it a little differently if I was starting all over. And before you jump in, Skip, Laureen asked for uh, a clarification. So on Facebook, there's really three types of things you can have. So, for example, I have a profile where I connect with people, but I also have a public page that everybody who asks to connect that I don't know, I send them there and I say, look, most of the stuff that you want to know, like what cool gear am I using, what great articles am I reading, I share that on my public page. With Photo Focus, we've put more effort into our communities than our pages because the problem with Facebook pages, and I don't want to get too far off track here, but basically unless you pay Facebook a lot of money, they only show your stuff to 10% or less, maybe even 5% of the people who like your page. On the other hand, a community allows people to interact. So we have communities for photo focus. I have communities for Pixel, uh, for customers of Red Pixels so that our customers can interact with us and each other and it's very personal that way. And so a community is a different type of interaction. Skip, you had one thing to throw, and then I think we should move into some of the pre-production yep. workflow. Yep. Well, first of all, if, if, if I had it to do over again, I'd probably be with you, Rich, or Kevin. But in my case, my 5,000 friends, uh, friends um, <laughs> are, all, are, are almost exclusively photographers. For me, what's happened is that my, my top, let's say, couple of hundred people, that I am closest to on a personal basis, Facebook has become the, the, the key mode to communicating through instant messages back and forth or, or Facebook email. So that becomes a great way to be able to get somebody live online and actually have a quick conversation about something. I only use my Facebook page for marketing. You'll never see me put something personal out about, oh boy, I just had yogurt, yum yum. Um, it's all going to be related to programming, business, educational material, and maybe what I ought to look at is to go back and maybe it's time for me to start a more personal page that I do use exclusively. Now, Rich, as far as, as Facebook's parameters changing, um, and I'm sorry I don't have the link directly, but if you go to skipcohenuniversity.com and just in the bottom left corner of the home page, type in Blake. Sunshine. Um, she used to work for Facebook and she just did a guest post a few months ago on what photographers need to know about Facebook. Because the parameters, even though they are looking for money and it is an advertising model, you can't promote, um, I can't think of what it's called, oh you can boost your personal page that will get it out in front of more people, right. but on a business page you can promote it and you can do some really interesting things and I'm hearing a lot of good stories from people who have figured out the right combination, the recipe. Uh, there was a post just recently in Going Pro by Brian Caparici where he talked about the parameters of Facebook and how he used a couple of key tools there to keep his messages in front of potential clients even though they had walked away but he actually wound up picking up one of those clients later on who had walked away but then kept seeing Brian's name come up in her news feed, in her timeline um, on various things that he was doing and she wanted to go back to him to talk about him shooting her wedding. 
So there are ways to make it work, but it is tougher than it's ever been before, and it is different. Every message you post doesn't doesn't suddenly go viral within your little community. I, I would just say that you know, and we'll put a button on this for for social media. Each platform is different. Each one hits more. You know, Pinterest is great for letting potential customers see your work. Twitter is great to briefly interact and keep your finger on the pulse. I use Facebook three different ways. My business uses it. I use it as an individual to keep in touch with my best customers or people I want to be customers. But I let myself be a person. You know, I blew my knee out the other day, and enough people knew about it, including some customers who, you know, sent a message of "I hope you're feeling better." Well, not that that's a test, but when some of the people that work with you actually care about you on a personal level, and you show that you care back you're more likely to have a longer term relationship if that's something you're looking for. And in my line of work it is. Now Kevin, <coughs> let's move on to some of the pre-production side. We've got a job, we've sort of spec'd it out, it's time to plan and we're getting ready to launch the project. What are three things you see people always do wrong at your workshops? The three things that they don't put enough time in to get right during the planning stage? Well, I'll, I'll speak to that from, I guess, the portrait wedding photographer perspective, since that's sort of been my specialty, although I've been you know, a commercial photographer for many years as well, but um, certainly a lot more planning involved on commercial shoots and estimating and you know booking models and props and locations and all of that, but um, we'll focus it on, say, the portrait wedding um, clientele. And of course, one of the first things you want to do is to schedule a client meeting to just talk about details and get to know the person because that's so important, I think, to effective portraiture and will include wedding and portraiture is, is uh, getting to know their personalities, their particular likes, dislikes, um, places that they frequent. Um, one of the big things that we do in our sessions is to integrate pieces of their personality, whether it's going to a favorite location, using props that they enjoy to use and that sort of thing, which is common. A lot of people try to do that, but I think not everybody realizes how important this is for portraiture, or how important it can be, uh, even if it, you don't ever use any of those props or locations, but to know that about the person helps to make a better session. So first thing I go to is just getting to know data collecting on that person, and all this goes into, the, into my Kumu or whatever system you're using, but keeping just liberal notes on the client and what they like, what they don't like, uh, their style. You might give them a personality. Uh, one of the things we've done before is to have personality types sort of uh, prepackaged like this type of person, this type of person likes these things, and maybe assign them to one of those categories if that helps you to then say, okay, well, this kind of client's going to like this type of package. They're going to like this type of experience. How can, I, how can I better facilitate that? So data collecting and keeping track of all of that is really important. That's our first step and of course technical details about locations and props and times of course very how essential. How much do you how much do you ask the subject themselves? How much do you talk to other people like a spouse or a business person related to them? And how much do you just get from snooping around on their social media? Like how much of a detective <laughs> are you, Kevin? Yeah, that's always great when they come in and you're like, so I hear you like coffee in the rain in uh, <laughs> Fresno. <laughs> I just happen to see that on your page, which is gets kind of creepy sometimes when you know too much about them. But uh, um, I, I always find it it's just great to have a face-to-face. -face. So as soon as we, we book uh, with a client, we set up a meeting to come in and just have a uh, sit-down. And that's when we just go through all this, we just talk about the details of their event or their portrait session, what they want to wear, but also the personality. So I try to get as much of it from them directly and a lot of times when they have a, a couple going for an engagement and they're together, you know, obviously the spouse reveals a lot about the other one that they may not reveal about themselves. So you have to kind of master the art of three-way conversation as well in those, in those meetings. Very cool. And what's one more thing you see people screw up a lot? Hmm. Well, at least from the, the the people that I talk to in my workshops, I think one of the the things that they're not doing enough of is putting themselves out there and asking for business, which we kind of alluded to earlier, is that they, for example, a comment I get when we're talking about shooting and in, uh, in the workshops, and we talk about these fun poses and. Every workshop I get, people say, well, my clients would never do that. 
And my first question to them is, do you ask them, you know, have you asked them if they would do this? Have you suggested that they try this or you know, go here? And they're like, no, but they just never would, you know, the, the people in my neighborhood are not like that. They don't like that kind of crazy stuff or whatever. And I used to think that too, but I think that, you know, just asking, just putting it out there is the hardest thing for us as photographers to do because we're so sensitive. We don't want to get our feelings crushed. And this could be at a meeting, you know. Generally, I could come up with these really fun plans for my wedding shoots or, or uh, engagement shoots by just suggesting things at the client meeting, saying, oh, you guys, you guys love to bike. Well, let's take your bikes and let's go down to this river and we'll plan a picnic and I've got this whole little idea and uh, I could be second guessing myself saying well, that's a goofy they're not gonna go for that but then they may say oh that's cool but how about if we go to this other location and do that too and then I've got umbrellas I can bring you know so they always add things to that but uh, I think fear fear of rejection fear of looking silly is something that photographers uh, need to get over and like I said I'm, I'm not perfect but that's something that I've learned the more I get over that, more I face those fears, the, the better my business, the better my relationships, everything has become. It actually carries through all the way into pricing. I remember years ago, um, Dennis Reggie doing a workshop and saying to photographers, do not price your work based on what you can afford. And then he added that it was years before he could have afforded himself. And the reality is that photographers... Kevin, you're dead on. I mean, they do second guess. They will. I've heard it so many times where where photographers have said, um, "No, that that isn't going to work here," and you yeah. automatically think that because you're part of that community, that obviously you know that it's not going to work, and that's absolutely not true. It is. It is about taking a few of those risks and planting the seed of what could be a really fun idea. Yeah. Yeah, perfect example. I moved here to, I live in Bend, Oregon right now. When I moved from Los Angeles um, 19 years ago, and uh, my business was going great in Los Angeles, and I had all these, you know, high end clients there. And I moved to Bend purely for uh, a lifestyle change. And I thought it was a town of 35,000 people, it was all farmers, and I thought there's no way I'm going to continue the same type of business that I had back in LA. But I said, well, I'm going to move there no matter what and figure out how to do it. And to my surprise, my business after the first year pretty much doubled almost every year what I had done in L.A. So it, it had nothing to do with the small town uh, preconception that I had. It really had me changing my mindset and figuring out how to go forward and how to do it in a small town. Very cool. Very cool. So... I think if I'm taking away with some of these lessons, what I'm hearing both of you say is you can't think about your customers like you were your own customer. You have to start thinking from their point of view and be willing to take some risks. And remember, with each new customer that comes in, this is an opportunity to try, try tweaking your message or tweaking your offer and see how people respond or you know, getting to know what they want and putting some suggestions out there. We'll oftentimes call it red wine, white wine, rosé. And I'll say, well, look, my job is to come up with some ideas, so let's throw down two ideas, or let's throw down three ideas as a starting point, and then we can have conversations, and we can make a good blend. You know, we just need a point to start, and I want your input here. Yeah. When people see that, you know, I'm just going to say, look, I'm going to put things out at different ends of the spectrum to get you to react, and we're just trying to find what's right for you. Oh, okay, so not every idea has to be killer. This is just to get a conversation started. Oh, right. Okay. Get it started is really important. Okay. Yeah. Now, you got, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I have to run and get my power adapter. <laughs> my computer is dying. I thought it was fully charged. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves for 30 seconds. No, right back. no problem. All right. So, Skip, as we're taking a look at this, and hopefully we don't lose Kevin to the power monsters, a uh, couple things. There, we're, first off, um, we're going to be giving away a full ticket to Photoshop World here in just a couple minutes to somebody who's here present to win. Now, I would encourage you all, if you are watching, to put your name into the Q&A comments, uh, if you could figure out how to do that, and we're going to pick from one of the Q&A comments. So leave a quick question or a comment, just check in that you're here, or leave a comment on the page. We're going to be picking one window randomly. And we'll be giving that away in about 10 minutes. So that's thanks to our friends over at Photoshop World, the Kelby One folks. Uh, Skip, 
as you're refining your workflow through the years, what are some big things that have changed for you? Things that really stood out as, oh, I need to make a change to what I do. Oh, first of all, my ability to procrastinate is is probably legendary. Um, I will I will hold off on things and I'll jump on it at the last minute. Um, my life today evolves. Um, it's evolved into more writing, social media. Um, when I started my own business and headed out on my own five years ago, um, I gave up the luxury of a staff that was going to remind me of stuff that I hadn't done yet. And I think the biggest thing for me has been developing the discipline. And it's funny because when you have your own business, and both of you guys know this, but I was living vicariously through you guys for so many years, when you have your own business, there are pluses and there are minuses. Um, the hardest part to me was developing the discipline to make sure I got everything that I wanted to do every day done. I have a group of sponsors slash partners that are involved in the SCU project. They have different needs. There are different things that I do with them. There are marketing calls that are made each month that are like conference calls with some of them that are on that kind of a package. The hardest part now is for me to separate myself from my work. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, my office is in my home. I have some local accounts here in Sarasota um, and projects that I work on um, with some other companies. But the reality is that, it, to me, it's all about discipline. It's the discipline to stay focused and to stay on point, and it's the discipline to let go of the business and remember that your priorities are your family and friends and that's why we're all in this business and sometimes it's it's tough especially Kevin mentioned it earlier you know photographers everybody wants to be liked you don't want somebody upset you want to do what they need boy if your day finishes off where you've got a troll that's just taking a shot at you sometimes it is really hard to just shut up and walk away from the computer and say, all right, that's it, you know, day's over, I'm going home. So for me, it's been absolutely a combination of discipline and consistency that was one of the hardest things to learn. Absolutely. And, you know, it's that idea of I always try to remind myself that I'm working so I can live. I'm not living so I can work. Now, I work a lot. I've got three businesses that I own. Kevin, you're in that same boat. One added benefit to having a system, and I think this will be a good chance for us to uh, sort of wrap up and talk about your workflow system just a little bit more. We have a standard, what we call control cycle, which is a series of steps that every new job or client project has, from capturing the information, to specking the job, to scheduling it, to making delivery, to closing out billing. And by having a checklist, it makes sure that we don't forget to do things and that we do the same thing for each job. And I can measure it. And in the office, we have a giant board where we're tracking all of the actual projects. And I made us go old school and put things up on the board with erase markers and status magnets. And everyone sort of laughed at it at first. And now it's a great comfort because at a glance, we could sort of see where the traffic jams are coming and when we're overbooked or overscheduled. And we can look at the control cycle and we know where we're at in the job. I read a great book a while back called The Checklist Manifesto that talked about how surgeons were using a checklist at a hospital. And they said, you know what, let's have a system, let's follow this. And by doing this system, not just somebody else's system, but their system. You know, I imagine you recommend people are adapting your workflow, but they still need to customize it. By following the steps, you screw up less. You keep happier customers. You could go home at night and actually feel like I didn't forget something. Right. You know, what's this advantage, Kevin, to actually being a little bit more process oriented? How's it changed your workflow? Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm. Uh, it took me a while to to really uh, to, I guess, convince myself that that was a good way to work because I. I've always been sort of a just freehand, you know, just do this what I feel like doing I'm and that an, sort of I'm thing, artist. which doesn't always <laughs> doesn't really work so well. <laughs> so you're managing a lot of a lot of different things at the same time, but uh, having a checklist and that's part of what um, I've built into my workflow system is that every single thing that can be checked and automated 
is. It's coming even down to creating folder templates with subfolder templates that I just duplicate when I start a new job. So I never have to redo any of it. It's always consistent. Um, I have checklists with inside of Kumu as you go through the job and you check off each stage when you burn your backup, when you verify your backup, when the client's been called and told their album. You know, every little thing has a checklist item, which really, really helps, of course, um, when you've got multiple things going on. And I, I totally agree that as much as I think photographers sometimes resist strict systems, um, the bottom line is that it, it works and you have to... And you realize, too, that you have more time for the fun stuff when you have a strict system and you stick with it because you don't have to think so much. And you just basically go through, boom, 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 you knock those things out, and then you've got time to go play, be with your family, or do more creative shooting or whatever it is you need to do. So, yeah, I totally agree that, that having a uh, automating, which is, I guess, one of the reasons I started writing actions for Photoshop years and years ago was why redo these things manually, you know? It can be automated via an action or a plug in. Um, there's no reason for me to try to recreate the wheel with every client and that, that made a huge difference in the bottom line um, profitability of my business because I had more time to spend on just getting new clients. Like Skip said in the beginning, you know, spend your time talking to clients and shooting and doing the things that you need to do um, and automate the other stuff as much as possible. Excellent. Well, Skip, I want to get a couple more of your thoughts, but two things here. Uh, we had two quick questions that should be easy to answer. But before we do that, folks, this is your last chance to either use the Q&A app to submit a question or to put a comment in in the Q&A field or a comment in on the web page. We're going to be picking a name from the comments or the questions for a full Photoshop World Pass. Uh, Kevin, that's actually where I first met you, and I, I, I appreciate actions. I love this workflow, this idea that a little bit of organization and making processes gets things done. Now, we had a, a good question. One was just a simple one to skip. Can you repeat the name of the author who wrote that Facebook article? Some folks want to look that up. Absolutely. It's on the skipcohenuniversity.com site. Go to the bottom right corner, search box, enter the name Blake, B-L-A-K-E, Sunshine. Sounds like a stage name, but she's an amazingly talented woman who worked for Facebook for two years and she wrote a guest post for me on what photographers need to know about the uh, new Facebook. Excellent. And we also had a good question, and I know that you guys probably have some opinions on this. And uh, the question was, how can I talk to a client? And so if they ask, you know, how can I offer a discount without using the word discount? It seems like a dirty word, or <laughs> I'm desperate. You know, I do different discounts all the way with things. You know, I'll have nonprofit clients that I'll charge less for. I'll have clients that if they're a cause I believe in, uh, I might make a donation back or will donate certain services uh, for clients that need a discount. But I go after, you know, we do a lot of work for uh, cause and issue groups that have lower budgets. But I'll put the full value on the invoice and then make a credit. But that credit actually says, this discount or this, you know, this free stuff is only good if you pay your bill on time, which uh, is a great motivator to get paid on time. But yeah. a lot of times we'll do things like, well, this is, you know, we have, um, we're giving this to our returning customers. We're letting you save this. Or, you know what, uh, I've got this new thing I wanted to try out and your project looks perfect. I am willing to do this if you can guarantee me you're going to give me a testimonial and I could follow up with you to get some specifics about after the fact. What are some ideas you guys have on how to motivate people through different pricing without sounding like you're Walmart? Yeah, I think um, I'll again I'll speak to it from the portrait and wedding perspective because um, yeah, people always want they want discounts of some sort and. Um, what I found that, that we found that works well for us is instead of offering discounts, we very rarely actually do a discount, but we'll, we'll add on and give them extra goodies or say, we'll give you an extra hour of time at the shoot or we'll do an extra this or that. Things that generally don't really cost us that much, but have a larger perceived value. So I can say, I can't give you a discount, but I can give you this extra thing that's worth another $500 if you you know want to book it today or something like that but I found that adding on things 
doesn't seem like you're cheapening yourself as much as discounting. Maybe, like you said, it's kind of a dirty word. Um, not saying that discounting is wrong, and in some situations you do it and it works, and if you find a way that works for you, great. Um, but we find kind of just turning that around into an add-on doesn't take anything away from the sale, gives them higher perceived value, and really costs us much less to actually implement by adding on things that, that are easy to add on for us. Yeah, so I want to add, don't subtract. Right. Correct. We add on value yeah. instead of subtracting. Some other some other ideas here. I mean, we I did a thing on a post on added value a few years ago, and one of the photographers I interviewed was Cliff Mountner, um, well known, well respected, outstanding wedding photographer. And Cliff didn't want a discount. And what Cliff came up with was some special promotions that he do where he added on an hour or two of coverage. So it is about added value. But also, people seem to have a hard time thinking of what things can I add. Well, pick up the phone and call your lab. If you're working with any reputable lab, they're going to have all kinds of exciting new things from, from uh, printing on metal, printing on wood, canvas. Um, just adding in a canvas wrap. Um, may be something that is unique enough to your client. I mean, as photographers, we think, well, who'd want that? Canvas wraps have been around for years. Being able to offer that as an add-on may be something that might actually be new to your client. Call your frame company and find out, consider putting together a, a, a large frame print that's going to go, you know, that might go over the uh, fireplace. Talk to your album company. Um, there's so many different things that are available in additional albums. So I think the key to me is finding added value. Now, there's no question that there are times when you may, really may have to do a discount. And Rich, I love the way you put it about, I've got something new that I'd like to try. If you're willing to do that, we could apply a discount so that it doesn't look like, you know, if you just ask the right way, you're gonna, he's going to knock 10% off or 20% off. Because the discount, when it becomes dollars and you're discounting dollars, you're turning your photography business into more of a commodity item. I'm not saying there aren't times that you might not have to do it. Certainly for a nonprofit, it becomes an easy thing to do if you're doing that kind of a project for somebody. But for the average consumer that's come to you and said, well, you know, I want, you know, will you shoot, I want you to photograph my wedding. Uh, it's kind of like a guest post I had from Simon King in the UK where he talked about we need to all act like fine chefs so that if somebody came into our kitchen and say, you know, how come your veal Oscar is three dollars more than down the street? We're not sitting there hemming and hawing trying to figure out how to discount and price match. And that's kind of simplifying it, but there are times when you have to discount, but Rich, I love the way you put it. Well, it, it always works out, and, and I do find if I give a discount that I always put it onto the invoice so they know what they got, uh, and, you know, in a polite way, but you have to balance this out. All right, so, Kevin, um, we're wrapping up here, and I just want to do a couple things. In the comments for the show, uh, there is a link posted by Jill Fisher on where folks can find out more about Kumu. Um, and just give people your website, you know, besides if they want to take a look at your personal work, tell them where to find you, and then also talk about your tools website and what are some of the cool things that people can find up there. Yeah, cool. Well, my uh, personal photography website is kevinkubota.com, and uh, kubotaimagetools.com is where you can find our software. We have workshops. Um, we have a really cool workshop coming up, uh, which is a... It's called Workshops with Purpose, and it's designed to take photographers who want to do some charitable work with their photography and to actually take them and lead them by the hand and go and do some charitable, charitable work. We did one last year in Kenya. It was a tremendous success and very, very powerful to all of us and attendee. And we're doing another one um, coming up uh, this year at the end of the year in Bolivia, and that's a really cool workshop, and it's a very limited uh, number of spots on that. We still have a few more left, so if anybody's interested in doing something to change the world with their photography, and that's a that's a good one to get into. Um, we've got a workshop in Africa, African Safari. We did that uh, a couple years ago. It was fantastic, so there's that coming up. Um, then, our, you know, of course, our software, our, our uh, plugins for Photoshop, 
on our website, and then the new Kumu software for managing your business. I also have a, um, a special that we were planning to make, which we could maybe make for your viewers of this program here on um, my workflow tutorial, which is the Lightroom Complete Workflow Workshop, uh, which we have a, a video on that packaged with the Kumu software, so you actually have the end-to-end, start-to-finish solution that we use and teach in the workshops, um, and we're going to package that together so we could, um, uh, if we wanted to, we could create a create a discount for your viewers on the fly and put that together for them, but that's all that stuff's on the Kubota Image Tools site. Well, excellent. Yeah, well, if you want to share that, we'll definitely put that in the comments. And for those of you who either came late or you missed part of this or you want to share it with other folks, the rebroadcast is available about five minutes after this ends. The YouTube video will go live, and we'll post this on PhotoFocus. Skip runs it over at Skip Cohen University. So you can actually revisit the page and share this information. There was one really good question. I was in the process of wrapping up, but a really interesting question popped up that I think you two are both very qualified to answer. And Rodney asked, Essentially, as you're getting started, how do you narrow your focus? And so, you know, uh, from being a general photographer to focusing on a specific area, do you actually refuse clients? And I'm going to throw out one idea, then I'm interested in hearing your things. I don't think you have to refuse work. I choose three criteria for clients. And what I say for me is that I want to work with people that are going to pay me a fair price, I want to work with people that treat me and my staff politely, that we enjoy working with. They're a joy to work with these folks. And I want to do work I'm proud of. And that looks good on my reel. And two out of three ain't bad. Meaning that I've got some clients that I do work for, like that I'm not crazy about the work, but they're so nice to work with and I love the people that I'll do that type of job for them. And they always pay their bills on time, and they're sweet, and they're great people, and it's awesome. And I've got work that is fantastic that other people would kill for. And they're jerks, and they take six months to pay. And they're a big PR firm, and I just tell them to take a hike because it's not part of my long-term success. But what I put into the portfolio, what I push and try to be known for, may not include that. Just because you take a job doesn't mean you have to ever tell anybody else about it. So get your bills paid, work for people you like, but build a portfolio around the type of work you want. Don't turn down work if you like the people. Either you guys want to comment on that or add to that with some other practical advice? Yeah, sure. Um, sure. One of the things that I love to do in my workshops is uh, called a keywording exercise. And this is something that I did for my own business years ago that kind of transformed my business and it was really to hone in on three keywords that described what my style, my vision was and to apply that to everything in my business, my, my branding, my fonts, my studio design, my logo and everything and to really focus my marketing on this one segment based on these keywords. So for me it was weddings and fun, romantic, sexy was the keywords that I had. This was many years ago. So I redesigned everything, focused all my marketing, everything on my website on the weddings to do with that three keywords. And my what I found is my wedding business just went way through the roof. That grew crazy. But my other jobs, like you said, I used to shoot you know, um, fashion things. I shot the headshots for actors in Hollywood and all these other things that I like to do, I even shot you know, surgery for hospitals because I thought it was fascinating and I didn't want to give that up, but I found that the more I became known, even though it was for weddings, the more I still got calls for other jobs just because I was becoming more known. So I agree you don't have to give up jobs, but I do feel that focusing my marketing gave me more of a name and more of a reputation which was helpful in getting all kinds of jobs. So it, it did... It, Focusing for me was was a good thing. Excellent. Skip, why don't you take us home tonight, and then I'll, I'll randomly draw one of our commenters' names. If you've added a comment or a note in the Q&A section or posted on the Google Plus page, we'll be able to pick from there. But, uh, Skip, why don't you throw out just a couple of closing comments and some resources before we do the big drawing? Well, let me just answer. I want to give one quick answer to Rodney. Rodney, if you want to email me, it's Skip at mei500.com. 
send me your phone number I'll give you a call tomorrow this is a really hard area for new photographers and it really to Kevin's point Kevin was talking about his marketing and tying in keywords but also when you're just getting started and you're trying to figure out all right what is my specialty it needs to start with what you're most passionate about what do you enjoy doing the most and how does that align with your skill set because one of the things that you can't do in photography is fake it till you make it um, you will get caught any I've, I've said this before any moron can get their first customer the key is to get the first customer to tell all the rest of your customers how good you are and get the first customer to come back a second and third time for other jobs and that really depends a lot on making sure you've got the skill set so that you don't sort of do a half-ass launch where you're really not ready to handle it and I agree with Kevin I mean you don't have to turn down work but when you do get caught and this is where a network of photographers can be important when you do get caught with a request for something that you're just not confident in you're just you know that you're missing a few things in the skills then have a couple of photographers that are in that most inner circle of yours that you're going to pick up a phone and say hey listen I've got somebody that needs to do maybe it's architectural work maybe it's baby photography but you're a wedding photographer and you're really not comfortable and you don't like doing it always have somebody in your network you can refer to so Kevin throughout his contact information absolutely recommend everybody go take a look at at Kumu because it could help this whole industry get more organized um, you'll find me at skipcohenuniversity.com and Skip Cohen on Twitter and obviously I just gave you my email a second ago and Rich where do they find you buddy well um, if you want to look me up you could just visit me as an individual at richardharrington.com but I am the publisher of photofocus.com which is a great resource site for photographers we try to help people out with a bunch of articles there we've got a writing staff of 12 folks uh, putting out things every day so check that out and uh, my company is Red Pixel R-H-E-D-P-I-X-E-L we do a lot in the video and the visual <laughs> imaging space plus you skip and the motion space sorry no no absolutely free sneezes with tonight's Thank thing you. So uh, I just did the random number generator, and it generated the number 17 out of 1 out of 26, which is the letter Q. And when I go through our commenters and posters, we didn't have anybody whose first name or last name started with Q, but we do have one that starts with R. So Rodney Turner, if you are still here, you are actually not only is uh, Skip going to take your personal phone call, but you're the double winner. You do get a full pass to Photoshop World. You'll need to get yourself to Las Vegas. That event is in September. So, Rodney, I want you to tell me right now in the comments that A, you're here, and B, you actually can use this pass. Because if you can't use this pass, we're going to give it away to somebody else. So, make sure you put a comment up there, Rodney, in the comments or in the notes. Let us know that going to Photoshop World is something you think you could do. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you now if you can. If not, and Rodney is unable to take it, then we'll give him a little bit of time to get in touch. Rodney, just go to Twitter, send me a message, or go to photofocus.com, click on the email button in the top corner, send me a message that you think you could do this. I'm going to need your name and your contact information so I can put you in touch with the folks at Kelby One. Uh, I know that, Kevin, you've been to Photoshop World before. Skip, I think you've checked out that event. It's a lot of fun. But besides there, is there any place else where you guys are going to be coming up? Any other events or training where people can see you at events, uh, trade shows? Kevin, you sometimes do things with WPPI. Anything else? Yeah, uh, we'll be at WPPI, and um, I've got a, a program coming up on Creative Live again. I've been on there a few times. Um, and then we have um, we have a schedule of um, smaller workshops that we're going to be putting onto our website uh, within the next couple of weeks. If people want to check that out, and that's kind of what I'm focusing on is a little more intimate, uh, hands-on workshop. So I'll have a, a schedule of those coming up soon. Very cool. Yeah, I'm very excited about Shutterfest 2015, which is Sal Sincata's brainchild. That's the first week of April uh, in Missouri. And if you just go, if you just Google Shutterfest. 2015 it'll get you all the information I know their first hotel is already sold out they book more rooms next door it's gonna be an absolutely killer little convention and workshop series because it gives you all the attention that some of the bigger shows don't quite give you anymore 
and I also recommend if any for anybody going to Photoshop World. You mentioned that a second ago. Um, if Rodney can't make it, somebody else hopefully can. It's a it's a great show. Yep, Rodney, make sure you drop me a line if you're looking to come in. I'll be at Photoshop World. Uh, the entire Photo Focus staff will be there, and a couple of our writers are actually speaking. So hope to catch up. Kevin, thanks so much, and Skip, as always, great to talk to you guys, and uh, thank you all for tuning in and listening, and be sure to pass the link on to some of your colleagues. Thanks, thank Rick. you.